Let's break down the fundamental jargon used in trail running. Welcome to episode 217 on the Healthy Runner podcast and our beginner's guide to trail running lingo. In this episode, we're going to dive deep into the world of trail running terminology and cover pretty much everything you need to know to communicate like a pro on the trail. So whether you're new to the sport or whether you really don't know anything about trail running like myself, um, or you're looking to expand your knowledge, this episode is really your ultimate resource. And today back on the show for the third appearance is our friend and our co-host, the co-host of the Inspired Souls podcast um, is none other than Kim Sankey. Kim, thank you so much for agreeing to come back on the show. Oh, it's always a pleasure, Dwayne. So happy to be on again. Yeah, thank you for uh, being willing to come on and probably allow me to embarrass myself when I don't know many of these terms. <laughs> um, and honestly, share all the knowledge that you have from your wealth of experience um, that you have with trail running. And for those that don't know who Kim Sankey is, she is a... Actually, you know what? I'm not even going to give a formal bio, Kim. If you don't mind telling uh, the listeners, if they haven't heard the other episodes that you've been on, um, who are you? Uh, where do you come from? What do you do? Well, uh, yeah, the who am I question. So <laughs> I am a, I could like to say I'm a, a mom, first and foremost. Um, I am a trail runner, uh, mother of two teenage boys who love their football. So my life is pretty much about running and football right now. I, a I am a licensed physiotherapist, we say here in Canada, physical therapist, where you are, doing. I've been practicing for over 20 years, but right now I'm, I'm my day job is in management. I actually manage a vision rehabilitation organization. Did you know that was such a thing, Dwayne? Vision I did rehab. Not. Yeah. No. For people who've partially lost their sight or fully lost their sight. So we work with guide dogs and teach people how to walk with their canes. And it's it's very interesting. So I, I manage an organization here in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And I do some home physio on the side right now. Um, I've been a runner essentially my whole life. Um, got into trail running shortly after university when I lived on the west coast of um, British Columbia and just loved exploring nature and going further and further into the mountains. And it was an organic evolution of short runs turned into longer runs turned to ultra marathons. So that's kind of what I've been spending my time doing for the last decade or so is spending a lot of time on the trails. And on that note, trail runners tend to kind of be a subculture of our own and have developed a little bit of our own language or lexicon. So I'm excited to talk with you and your guests a little bit about what the heck does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited to honestly learn more and Really, to add honestly to your bio, because I think it's something that um, I know we've talked about in the past uh, that you didn't mention, but I know you have a wealth of experience. You like used to work at the Gate Lab, and mm -hmm. you have a lot of experience working with runners earlier in your career as a physio. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you come with a wealth of experience in kind of different areas of practice, research realm, um, yes. Gate Lab, leadership route, uh, and then obviously your podcast. and. Have we hit the big oh. uh, 200 episodes yet? Not quite. We're coming we're, up. We're getting we're close. We're By the time this them. is released, yeah. you might be, we're honestly. Be close. So yes, my my friend and co-host Carolyn Coffin and I started that podcast over three years ago now, almost three and a half years ago. And we've been yeah. dutifully recording once a week for three and a half years. It's hard to imagine, but we love it. It is definitely a passion project for us, as I know this podcast probably is for you too, Dwayne. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm so, I'm so proud of you guys, honestly. And just having done the whole 200, you know, episode and Carolyn was nice enough to come on and, um, interview me for that. Wasn't episode. that great? Oh, it was so good. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Um, yeah, she did a phenomenal job, but yeah, congrats to you guys because it is a passion project and like all the, the work behind the scenes and the planning and the pre the post-production, all of that. Um, yeah, kudos to you guys and yeah, celebrate that 200th uh, episode and the consistency that you've shown, right? Um, all of those weeks. Well, you know, it, just as you were saying that, I was thinking there's so many parallels to the personality types that make a good runner and a good podcaster, right? You have to be consistent. <laughs> just so showing true. up every week, 
doing the work. And eventually you see the payoff, which, um, yeah, we're just having a lot of fun with it. Yeah, absolutely. And for those that um, haven't heard the other episodes and you're interested in learning more about trail running, uh, Kim has been literally our expert <laughs> um, <laughs> in covering the trail running topic. Back in episode 108, uh, Kim and Carolyn came on the show to talk about like the differences between trail running and road running. Um, so you might want to check that one out. And then the other one was super, super beneficial was episode 162 on the Healthy Runner podcast, where Kim really shared it was like phenomenal tips, by the way, 10 tips to go from like road to trail. So if you're getting started in trail running and you're listening to this right now, you're like, oh, yeah, I want to know the lingo. Um, go back to episode 162 and the blog for that, because we kind of lifted listed out all of Kim's uh, 10 tips. Um, they were very helpful. I remember getting a lot of feedback, actually, from that episode from those that are listeners who are trail runners, they were like, yes, they were really great uh, tips. And uh, yeah, let's be honest, it was more like 57 tips. <laughs> 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 we tried to categorize them into 10. <laughs> 10 it was a fun one, though. So I'm glad some people enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. And if you're tuning into this and you're really um, doing primarily road running, then, you know, definitely stick around and listen to this, of course. But also check out episode 213 in Kim's. Uh, co-partner, uh, Carolyn Coffin came on the show to talk all about kind of like road running terminology 101 or things runners say. And as we were going through, um, this list that Kim sent me because yeah, I don't really know half of these things. I was like, okay, this is good. Cause this is a totally different list that we talked about with, uh, Carolyn. So if you're looking for more running lingo that isn't relevant to today, go back to 213 and listen to that episode um, with Carolyn. So let's get into today's topic of really hey. talking about kind of trail running terminology 101 or the things that trail runners say. So yeah, let's get to like the, the types of it. trails first, like buffed out single track. Oh, what is yes. that? I like remember when I... I Mentioned Strength that training on, in the gym? <laughs> yes, not quite. I mentioned that during one of our previous conversations. You were like, whoa, 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 stop. What What did you just say? So buffed out single track. Um, you think of what is buffing something, right? It's making it smooth and, and pretty. So buffed out trails are typically very smooth, no rocks, roots. Um, single track means it's a very narrow trail. There's only enough room for one person to run, run on it. You can't run side by side. So that's kind of like a trail runner's dream is running downhill in a nice, long, buffed out single track section. You just kind of flow down the trail. So you don't have to think too much about picking up your feet. It's almost like road running, but there's usually lots of curves and some hills. That's what, what buffed out single track is. All right. If, the, if it's wide enough for two people, is it called a double track or no? Yeah, not pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Wider okay. trail. Quad okay. track sometimes because often quads make those trails, right? So, yeah. Okay. And single then track to if, quad track. If you're on the single track, and I'm going to have so many follow up questions to this because uh, I'm just curious. Uh, if you're on that single track, like you said, it's like a trail runner's dream where you see that single track and you're just going downhill. What happens if there's someone else on the track? Like, <laughs> does that ever happen? <laughs> Good like, question, Dwayne. <laughs> uh, yes, it definitely happens, and it all it will happen in races too. Like, what if you want to pass oh, wow. a section like that, right? Okay. So, yeah, you've just got to hop off the trail, find a good spot that you can jump around them, hop around Try to them. Pass. Okay. Right? Yeah. All right. All right. It's kind of like I'm sure, definitely not like, but as I mentioned in my uh, dopey recap episode in like Run Disney, where you know it's really crowded in the beginning, so I'm like hopping up on the grass and it's dark out and it's uneven. So I had to kind of hop on the grass to get around some people. So same thing happens in the trails. I'm sure it happens in the trails. Yeah, a lot, probably more dangerous because uh, it could be even more unstable. It can be, and that actually that could be our next. Next year's topic All right. is trail runner etiquette. But um, essentially, you usually let somebody know when you want to pass. If it's a steep, you know, or a cliffy section, the person, you know, usually that's going uphill will step to the side on the uphill side so that the person coming downhill has free free passage because it's usually more harder to stop yourself going downhill than up. <laughs> so, yeah, sense. there's ways to kind of safely get yourself around. It just depends on the type of trail. All right. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And what about gnarly? What, what mm -hmm. does that mean if it's a gnarly trail? 
Yeah, my girlfriend and I were just actually having a discussion of what gnarly means to each of us. I tend to define gnarly as technical. So there's <clears throat> distractions on the trail. There's roots, there's rocks, there could be mud bogs, there could be um, logs to crop, hop over, but it's definitely something that you have to pay attention to. It's not buffed out single track. It's the exact opposite. Some other people define gnarly as if you're in a mountainous environment, it could almost be very rocky or maybe even almost a scramble where you have to use your hands and your feet to get along that section. You could debate whether that's actually running, but let's be honest, <laughs> sometimes you just have to bridge a section to get from where you can run to the next section of where you can run. So gnarly is, is something with lots of technical components. All right. And then I, I feel like we did mention this in the last episode, mashed potato snow. Mm, yeah, that's a fun one. So yeah, think of, of snow that has been ran over multiple times. So you'll typically experience this in a race, right? Where if you're running along a snowy section, I can think particularly a good example was along a lake, you know, just kind of offshore on the ice part of the lake, but it was all snow. And as people were running over it, it got soft. You'd sink in maybe to your mid uh, lower calf, but the snow is kind of like mashed potatoes, right? It was oh like goodness. dense, but soft enough you'd sink in and never even, you're always kind of in your foot's going down in different ways. So not fun. I actually really don't like running on mashed potato snow. It's yeah. yeah I could sweaty. see that <laughs> definitely being hard. And yeah, a little like nerve wracking because you don't necessarily know how deep your foot's going to go each step, right? Yeah. Or is it pretty possibly. consistent? It, it tends to be, if you get mashed potato snow, it's usually pretty cold at that okay. point. If it gets warmer, it'll turn to slush, right? But if it's still snow, it's usually pretty cold, which means that it will pack down a bit on the very bottom, but it's not like you're running right on the top of it. You're sinking down into it. All right. Next, next term here. It's runnable. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. Okay. There's been memes made about this. It's runnable. Yes. It's quote <laughs> runnable. Wink, wink. So what does a trail runner mean when it's runnable? Well, uh, literally that. So you can actually run on it. So a lot of trail runs will have hiking sections to them, right? It'll just be too steep to efficiently run um, uphill particularly. So if you say it's runnable uphill, it's usually at a grade that most people could continue to run for the majority of it uphill without blowing up. Um, what's runnable for an elite runner is completely different than for a beginner <laughs> runner. So if people are talking about it's runnable, you want to know who you're talking to and what they define as runnable. Right. Um, for the downhill sections, often it'll be the technicality of it, that, or it's just too steep. It's either too technical or too steep to safely run on, so you need to slow down and walk in that section. Um but if a person says it's a very runnable course, it's a very runnable race, it means, yeah, you you actually will probably spend the majority of your time truly running the entire time. Um, and most people will versus who that was a completely not runnable back half, meaning maybe there was tons of mashed potato snow. Maybe it was <laughs> very technical. It was very boggy. You'll get anything on the trail, right? <clears throat> All right. All right. And um, what about, you know, I was doing this uh, trail race and, you know, there was this like yo-yo part of the course. What, what does that mean? <laughs> so, yo, so I know when you chatted with Carolyn uh, last week, I think it was, I don't know when it, when this episode will air, but it just yeah. dropped a few days ago from the date of this recording, you talked about out and back sections. So that's essentially the same thing as a yo-yo. Um, trail runners like to be weird. So we just throw in terms like yo-yo instead of out and back. So if you yo-yo a, a trail, you're running out and back. It's often used in the same kind of sentence of conversation when people talk about FKTs. So Whoa. do you want to go there and address yeah. what an FKT, FKT is right now first? Yeah. What is that? <laughs> so FKTs became very popular during COVID. It stands for fastest known time. So Trail runners like to run in a variety of ways, right? You can race or you can just pick a route, say in the mountains, you know, that, that people tend to like to hike or, or um, run and say, okay, I'm going to try to do this, be the fastest person ever to do this route. And often if you have a point to point section, 
Um, people will have the fastest snow on time going one direction, and sometimes they turn around and run it back. So you'll have an FKT one direction, and then you'll have a yo-yo FKT where you go out and back. All right. And it, these are um, tracked. There's rules. There's websites where you have to upload your Garmin data. Like it's become very official. Um, you have to announce that you do it in advance. You have to have witnesses. Um, there's rules oh, of wow. whether you're supported or unsupported, meaning did you carry every single thing you needed on your back the whole time? Did people meet you at certain checkpoints and give you supplies? So there's, it's kind of become this whole thing of its own, the FKT. Um, wow. Is there like an official mm -hmm. site? That mm -hmm. this gets there is. logged I think in. It's time dot com. I think is. is oh wow. It is. Yeah. Interesting. And another person with a passion project that has made it his labor of <laughs> love to assess and ver validate FKTs worldwide. Yep. Uh, all right. So if I had to, so I, uh, the yo yo is out and back. So I would imagine is is that the same thing as a boomerang? Because a boomerang, yeah, when you throw it, it yeah, comes absolutely. back. Mm -hmm. Is that the same exact yeah, boomerang term? yo yo? Kind of the same. All right. And then lollipop, you're in like a lollipop section of a race or course. Yeah. What does that mean? So think of what a lolly, what the outline of a lollipop looks like. So if you have a lollipop section, it's a section of trail where you will run out, you'll break off, you'll start doing a loop, and you complete that loop, and then you come back to the stick of the lollipop and then you run back to join the main trail or the rest of the race along that same stick of the lollipop. So there'll be a, an out and back section where you'll pass runners, right? Mm -hmm. There'll be people going both directions, but in the loop, everybody will be going in the same direction. So in a trail race, it's a good spot to see where you are in relation to your competition um, because you can often see the people ahead of you coming back on the stick of the lollipop. Or right. if you're at the lead, you'll see the people behind you <laughs> coming up the stick as you finish that section. Right. Yeah. And that, mm -hmm. that's, I, I would say, is similar to like a road race. You know, there are sections of road races where that happens as well. There's like little loops and you wind up, you know, coming back, um, which is always nice. And sometimes when you think you're going to see someone, you know, who's running the race, and you miss them, then you're like, oh, it must have been like on that. I wouldn't have said lollipop, but I would have said like the loop section. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, OK. Now Very, you've got a new new way to use the word. New terminology. I just think of like section. Candyland, lollipop. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> they play Candyland in Canada. But <laughs> if you guys grew up with that game. Um, <laughs> yes, we did. Yeah, we had that here. All right. And uh, so we talked FKT. So what about VK? What is VK? VK. VK stands for vertical kilometer. And that has also become quite a phenomena. So uh, it's a vertical kilometer is a thousand vertical meters. So it doesn't mean, you know, you're climbing a ladder for a thousand meters, but it means over the distance of the race, over many kilometers or miles, um, horizontally it is, there's a thousand meters of vertical gain. So the shorter the race, obviously the steeper the route's going to be. You know, a VK over a five-kilometer race is a 20% grade the whole time. Over a three-kilometer race, it's going to be, you know, 33% grade. So um, it's it's a sport. There's, there's races that are just simply vertical kilometers to see how fast you can get up and then also how fast you can then turn around and continue to run down without doing somersaults all the way down. In, um, in the UK, they kind of call it fell running, um, running downhill really fast. But yeah, there's also um, race. A lot of um, places will have these race weekends where there will be in Golden here in British Columbia near Banff. They have, I think the VK is on the Friday night. Then there'll be like a a 10k on the Saturday and a half marathon on the Sunday or something all in the trails. So, Oh, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, how about vert? What's the vert? vert? So vert is the amount of vertical or gain or elevation that is over a course. So trail rollers really like to brag about vert. This is one of those things. <laughs> People don't care how, right. how far you went. What was the vert? How, how many, how many thousands of feet did you you know, climb on this run if you live in a mountainous place. It's another thing they'll ask right away about a race or race course. What's the vert in that race or what's the gain in that race? Because the profile could be completely different. You know, a uh, 50K with 
I'll try to talk in in uh, American units here. <laughs> Mileage. Uh, let's say a thirty mile run, oh, with you know two thousand feet of vert is going to be totally different than a thirty mile run with you know ten thousand feet of vert. So, yeah, okay. it's kind of, and- it is. Trail runners do think in the Cartesian plane, right? We think in two axes. It's not just how far it is across, it's how much up and down there is, because that really can change the experience of the race or the run. Okay. And is the vert, just to clarify there, is it um, how many kilometers you actually gain in elevation, or is it the subtraction of like the up and the downs? And what is the net kind of vertical? Yeah, so that's a good question. No, typically it's used to express just the up. Okay. So a net net um, vert will be zero if you're going up and down the same amount. Right. If okay. it's a net downhill, then there's going to be you know more down than up. But vert tip always talks about the up. Nobody ever. Right. Talks okay. Too much about the yeah, because I think you know road races. A lot of times uh, I feel like everyone like race directors or whatever, like to market their racers and, the, and they'll say like, you know, zero gain or flat course or net flat, whatever. But then you actually run the race and it's a lot of up and a lot of down. So mm-hmm. it's a hilly mm-hmm. course and people get the impression that it's like a flat course because there's no like elevation gain, uh, but they were actually going yeah. up as much as they were going down. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. A lot of trail races will list different sections with the amount of gain and loss because, you know, okay, so this section you're going up 2000 feet and you're going down 500 feet. And then the next section you're going to go down 800 feet and only gain 50 feet. So it'll kind of give you an idea of how you, how you're going to work in those different sections. Okay. All right. All right. What about Trek? What's Trek? Trek is a, is a fancy word for walking. <laughs> <laughs> you don't okay. want to ever say that we walk. We Trek. Dang it. Ah, okay. So, yeah. Um, Trek, power hike. Um, it's walking though with purpose. So it's kind of used on those non-runnable sections. If you can't run any more efficiently, sometimes it really is more efficient to track. I have been <laughs> caught trying to run sections and I've looked behind me and the people behind me are just power hiking along. And I'm like, why am I wasting all this energy right. burning out my calves trying to run this section? I should just trek, right? So trekking poles are often used in those sections okay. um, to be more efficient. Um, you know, a, a good trekker, I'm trying to think in miles an hour here, can, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty short, but I can trek over four miles an hour. I can usually power along, but four, four and a half miles an hour trekking. So there's certain sections that you're not even running five miles an hour. So you might as well trek, right? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. When you're okay. in mountainous terrain. Yeah. And this is uh, super uh, specific, but just kind of curious here. Uh, with your trekking poles, do you know that in advance? Like you've already looked at the the course and you're like, hey, this section, I understand I'm going to need to trek all right, I'm approaching that section. Let me pull out my poles. Or is this like totally random? You you get to a point, you're running and you're like, yeah, I'm just like burning way too much energy. It's going to be more efficient to trek right here. Let me pop my poles out. How does that work out? Ooh, that is another- Is it like a really, combination of both? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting discussion because- So if it's a race and you've done your homework and you know what's coming from the different sections, you you're typically prepared that, yeah, this is going to be a pole section and you can run with poles, too. You don't have to just um, trek and sometimes running downhill with poles. It's almost like downhill skiing, like you use the pole to kind of center your gravity and your your balance Mm. as you're going down. Um, just don't try to pass someone while yeah, you got your yeah, poles out. Exactly. <laughs> on a single track. Them. Well, yeah, holding them in one hand, sticking out to the side, it can get dangerous. But <laughs> it's it's really not efficient to use poles if it's just going to be like 10 steps, right? You want to make sure right. this is a section where you're you're it's worth getting those poles out. It's worth putting them in your hands. Um, my rule is if I can see the top, it's not worth it. If it's, if it's a section, I just, I have no idea where the top of this climb is it. And I'm starting to feel, um, 
like I want a little extra power, I'll pull the pulls out. Everybody has their own rules, but yeah. Okay. All right. Um, that makes sense. And we have on the, the list here traction. So if I had a guess, let's, let's see if yeah, <laughs> Dwayne yeah. can guess, guess the term What's here. What's traction? Um, traction would just be, ref- would refer to uh, how much grip you have underneath your feet, maybe? Yes, absolutely. So this actually can be a uh, roadrunner term as well. But traction, I mean, if you're talking about how much traction your shoes have, yes, absolutely. Like how deep are the lugs? How, what's the type of, of outsole? Is it Vibram? Is it, you know, um, you know, basically what kind of material is, is mm-hmm. the also made of, but if somebody uses traction as a noun, like, are you bringing your traction today? What they're talking Ooh. about is micro spikes usually, or some, some kind of, um, thing that will help you on ice. So if you think running along the street is dangerous on ice, try running down a 20% grade onto your ice. It gets pretty darn dangerous, right? I could not imagine. So <laughs> yeah, shoes will either have traction built right in, you can get spikes, you know, like shoes like ice bugs that are uh, it's built right into the shoe or you can bring traction that you take on and off Um, in an area like I live here in um, in the Rockies you know Kananaskis Banff area it this is this year's been a perfect example we had the polar vortex you know in early January where it was literally minus 45 and that's where Celsius and Fahrenheit converge right is it minus 40 so it was really (laughs) cold and this last week it was well above zero, like everything melted and then it now froze again. So we have a lot of variation in our temperatures here, which means it's always going to be icy. You might have snow on top of the ice, but you're pretty much guaranteed to have ice on the trails for the majority of the year. So traction is really important. But as you, as spring comes and those weather changes happen, the entire trail isn't going to be consistent. You can have muddy sections, you can have rocky sections. And then when you go on like the the north side in the shade, it'll be ice. So sometimes mm. having traction you can take on and off is is good. You may not want to have your spiked shoes on that entire run because it's not great running on sheer rock with spikes, right? So right, okay, that yeah. makes sense. And I've used this term before. I'm interested to see if you use it in the same fashion. But like you're entering the pain cave. Yeah. Well, okay. well, how do you define that? <laughs> How would you define that? <laughs> Why don't you tell me first? <laughs> to me, that's that's the end of, you know, a marathon effort, uh, even a half marathon effort where, you know, you're hurting. You're 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 starting to almost red line. Um, you know, you're using every single uh fight mental mantra you can at that point. You're starting counting exercise, you know, vision it might be starting to get a little blurry. Uh, you know, you're you're really <laughs> you're you're hurting. You're hurting. Yeah, this is I, like absolutely. you're pushing and t- taking your body to the limits essentially. So, yeah, absolutely. And and this is where I think my definition will will tend towards more ultra trail running than shorter trail running because they aren't the same thing. Trail running doesn't have to mean ultra. (laughs) But as Mm -hmm. you start to go even longer, um, the pain game becomes less physical and it definitely is more Mm. mental. So you may not be moving fast enough to have, you know, a lactate (laughs) burn, (laughs) but, but your world is narrowing, right? You feel like you're entering that really dark place. Like you said, the vision, um, starts to narrow and your, your sense of your environment starts to disappear and you're in your own misery of suffering (laughs) (laughs) and, and the, you know, those, those negative thoughts, the bargaining, you know, should I quit? Should I not quit? Sometimes it's gut related. Sometimes you feel really crummy in your belly. Um, sometimes it's sleep deprivation. For me, the pain cave usually comes nearing the dawn of the next day. So if you've started a race and you're now like 20 hours in and you've been all night. I'm a night owl. I love the midnight two o'clock, but you hit three 30. Oh, it's just like the sun's not coming up. It's cold. You, you know, your body's saying, I want to be in bed now. I don't want to be out here. Right. So, um, yeah, I would say the pain cave can mean something different for so many different people, but it usually, I think whether it's physical or mental, 
relates to that narrowing of perception, right? All you can think about is yourself and your own misery. You're not thinking about <laughs> anything else. Um, it is possible to come out of the cave. Mm. Um, some people like Courtney DeWalter, uh, most people, even non-trail runners know who Courtney DeWalter is. She's basically, um, well, she was just named Ultra Trail Runner of the Year. Yeah. Um, she talks about actually trying to go into the pain cave as fast as she can. She just dives right in there and gets it over with <laughs> and then comes out on the other side. So different people use different mind games and mental tricks to deal with the pain cave. But it's a place that I think if any runner that's been running long enough will experience at some point, the key is how long do you want to stay in there? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So it, it does sound like for ultras, you pretty much come out of it, right? There is a, there is a point that you do come out of that? I would say, again, everybody's going to be different. Every experience is different. But yes, it is possible. Sometimes you can come into the, that cave multiple times in a race, right? <laughs> and it is really fascinating that you can feel so incredibly crummy. And then an hour later, it's like you just woke up and started running again. Like the body is a really and the mind are really strange, especially if it comes to sun up and a dawn and and fresh cup of coffee and off you go when you're out of the pain cave. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I know that was similar to what you had talked about with Carolyn on your show when you guys had kind of this conversation um, in what runners say, kind of similar to like when you hit the wall and, mm -hmm. you know, for most marathoners, it's like you hit the wall, you stay at that wall. And I know you had mentioned for like ultras, you can hit the wall and then come out of the wall. And so it sounds yeah, like fine. almost like a similar concept to the pain cave that th there's a chance exactly. of coming back. And yeah, I think most marathoners or half marathoners probably finish the race in the pain cave. Um, well, exactly. <laughs> because you're, you're pacing to use about a hundred percent of your energy up at that finish line. Right. Well, every right. race is, but, um, yeah, there's time, right? Like you can you can do it in the the hour and a half to three hour mark, right? Right, right. <laughs> so yeah, you're not going to sit around and wait for half an hour for things to clear and then keep going. You're just going to finish the race. Whereas if the race is 24 hours long, y you can't do that. You can't run yourself into the wall and tell you there's no coming back. So right, right, that makes sense. And this next term sounds a little shady. I'm not going to lie. This is like kind of like a drug deal gone bad, like a drop bag. What's up with that? Oh, a drop bag. <laughs> you got like okay. random drop bags, like, you know, some stuff happening in the inner city. What, what's a drop bag? <laughs> yeah, this is one of those terms that is so common and normal to me that I have to, I do a double take sometimes. I'm like, what do you mean you don't want to know what a drop bag is? So a drop bag is literally a bag full of stuff that you leave somewhere along the race course. So again, for longer races where you're going to be out there for a longer period of time, you may need um, fuel, you know, gels, bars, electrolytes, more than what you really want to or can carry on your body um, at a time. And so you can leave drop bags at certain aid stations, which are spots where you can pick up said drop bags. So what you will typically do is the night before the race, um, if we're talking a race environment, and when you check in and pick up your bib, they'll have spots that you can leave your drop bags. You usually label them with your bib number and the aid station that you want it to go to. The race um, organization will deliver them to that spot. They'll usually have them in a like a gazebo pop-up tent, so they're kept dry. And when you come up to that aid station, you go grab your drop bag and you can get depends on how big of a drop bag they allow or how long the race. I've left a fresh pair of shoes in my drop bag. I've left clean oh, wow. socks. I've left spring energy gels, which are my favorite. Um, I've left my poles in drop bags sometimes because I knew the race started fairly flat, but the next section mm. was climbing and I didn't want to carry the poles for the whole flat section. So I'd pick them up from my drop bag. So as much as you can pick up stuff from a drop bag, you can also leave stuff. So if you're moving from morning to night, you may pick up your headlamp, you may change your shirt, leave your sweaty, <laughs> sweaty hot, you know, shirt that you used in the heat of the day and pick up maybe a warmer shirt and potentially a coat. Um, mm. 
if you're changing shoes, you would obviously leave your wet, muddy shoes in your drop bag and take your nice, clean, dry shoes with you. So yeah, it's kind of like a restocking option, if you, especially if you don't have family or friends there to meet you to have your drop bag, um, your, your supplies, you can self-support by leaving them there. One thing yeah. I will, a little tip I will give back to the trail, you know, top 10 tips <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on this topic, though, is that if you if you're a newer trail runner and you decide you want to leave a drop, you want to have crew, sorry, come meet you at the different aid stations. I would still highly recommend leaving a drop bag with all of those essentials just in case. Just in case your crew gets lost, they get a flat tire, they under or overestimate your arrival time. There is nothing worse than showing up in an aid station, expecting to see somebody with, you know, that extra gel and, you know, chapstick and fresh clean socks and they're not there. And or even worse, you expect them to have your headlamp going into the night section and they're not there and you can't go because you you're waiting for your light. So mm. if you leave it in the drop bag, your crew can get that bag for you. They can have it ready, but you have that peace of mind of knowing, oh, even if something happens to them, my stuff is there. I'm gonna be okay. Right. And is that pretty much like hundred percent reliable? Um, like you've never been in a situation where you did have a drop bag and like, wasn't there? Never. No. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, All right. That's and something I think every race organization knows is, would be right, pretty important. Super <laughs> important. Right. And it could be dangerous, right? Yeah. For, for those reasons of, of lights and, and fueling and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. Okay. And are the drop bags at, you mentioned aid stations, are they always at the aid station? Like where you could have family members? They're present or no? Are they in different sites? There will always be at a designated site um, and usually at a place where vehicles or at least quads can get in because nobody wants to pack <laughs> volunteer to haul people's drop bags on their back. <laughs> um, but it can be either or. You can leave drop bags at aid stations where your crew can't access or and or you can leave them sometimes at places where crews can access. So it can be both. All right. Um, Okay. So yeah. Uh, fueling, I think we've covered before. I think most people can, you know, recognize what that is the nutrition, right. That they are taking mm -hmm. in. How about hydration? Um, I know your point is that it's not just water. What else entails hydration in your mind? Yeah. So again, I'm not sure this, this definitely isn't specific to trail runners, okay. but I have a little bit of a passion for people just assuming that hydration only means water because you can get into real trouble if all you're taking in is, is water. You need those electrolytes, right? Um, I personally have had a really bad experience with hyponatremia, which is too much water, not enough salt. Um, and it actually almost became very dangerous. You, you can have heart problems. You can have brain swelling. Like you can have some significant issues mm -hmm. if you, if your electrolytes get really out of whack. So just drinking water doesn't mean you're hydrated. That water needs to get into your, into your system, right? <laughs> into your bloodstream and not just sit in your belly or in, in the tissues, you know, surrounding your, your um, blood vessels. So having, um, you know, your sodium, your potassium, your magnesium, um, as well as your water is really important, especially if you're getting into longer races, right? Where, where again, you can't just push for another 20 minutes and then go home and have a beer. Like you, you need to be out there for a long time. Right. Um, but I, this is where I will also say though, that hydration doesn't necessarily mean fueling. <laughs> you can have fuel in your hydration, right? You can have calories and glucose and fructose in your hydration mix, but they're not necessarily the same thing. And so being able to sometimes separate that, I appreciate, like, I don't like to have calories in my water because sometimes if you're drinking to get enough calories, you're actually over drinking the liquid. Mm. So it'd be nice to be able to separate those two out. Yeah. No, great points. Great points. Um, how about trail nap or dirt nap? Are you dirt just taking nap. a nap literally like on the floor? Literally in the dirt on the side of the trail. <laughs> yes. so when, if you ever have a trail runner friend, if you're a runner listening to this and you're like, yeah, I've got some, a few trail runner friends and they just throw out flippantly about having a dirt nap. That's what they mean. Literally laying down on the side of the trail and going to sleep. It's often for only a couple minutes, like maybe three to five minutes. Um, if it's an ultra, 
but yeah, you'll just lay down on you the side of the road. Do you set an alarm or no? Like your body just... If you're alone, up. you can. Um, at, trail runners that need dirt naps are typically ones that are going really long, right? Like for 100 miles, 200 miles. They will often have a pacer with them, which is somebody running with them who will wake them up. Okay. Uh, stand guard, make sure they don't sleep for too long. Okay. Yeah, I've I've seen it all. I've seen people lay down near on a in a haystack. <laughs> I've seen people. I was once doing a raise and tripped over my friend who had laid down what he thought was on the side of the trail in the middle of the night, and he was halfway across the trail. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, and he was out cold, like out cold. So it happens. Yeah, Have you, you done a trail nap friend. before? You know, oh, that's a good question. No. Okay. No, I've never actually slept during a race. Yeah. I had to pause there because I had a race where I very much planned to. I wanted to push the uh, 48 hour limit and see, see how long I could go without sleep, but I had to drop because of injury. So I never got quite that far, but no, never okay. slept on the side of the trail. Interesting. Yeah. All right. What about muling? What, hmm. what does that mean? Yeah, muling. That's an interesting one. So muling is carrying another runner's supplies for them. So back to the fact that when a race gets long enough, often you'll be allowed a pacer, which is different in trail running than road running. Um, in trail running, the pacer is sometimes there to keep you going fast, but usually is there to keep you <laughs> entertained, conscious, on the trail, not going off in some direction that, you know, will get you lost in your, in your fatigue state. Um, you know, just keep you company. And so a pacer can be there to provide moral support, verbal support, map and directional support, but cannot most, I don't know of a single race that will allow a pacer to meal for you, which is carrying your water, carrying your hydration, carrying, you know, supplies that you might consume. There's rules about you can only pick up supplies in the aid stations or, you know, in certain spots on the route. It's cheating, right? Yeah. So does the Mueller, they don't do the full race, right? No, no. Pacers okay. will typically come in for sections from an aid okay. station to an aid station or every race is different. Some will allow them, um, almost from like the 30 mile mark on others won't allow it um pacers until the halfway point depends on the mm. distance and length of the race okay all right and uh, you mentioned this term kind of in passing before like crew like your crew those are like the people supporting you for the race is that correct yeah yeah so trail runners who who go again a bit longer so i know this is really more ultra specific but will often have support crew, literally like a NASCAR bit station <laughs> crew. It's actually really fun. Your runner will come in and depending on their, their state, their physical and psychological state, usually the aim is to be in and out as fast as possible. Like we're talking minutes, um, two minutes, five minutes max, 10 minutes is considered a long stop. Unless you're, you know, needing a reset, unless you're really <laughs> in rough shape, then you'll stay longer. Um, and so the crew will usually have, you know, a blanket, a couple chairs, things laid out, you know, the, any blister care stuff, um, the water bottles ready to switch out in your packs. Sometimes people will just switch whole packs. They'll come in and their crew will just grab one pack and shove the other one at them. If you watch the elites, um, they'll be there to provide sometimes ice, emotional support, but crew is not mandatory. It is entirely possible to do a trail race without crew. The longer it gets though, sometimes it's really, really nice to see a friendly face and have sure. some hot soup and yeah, have somebody there to support you. So um, yeah, crew, crewing. If somebody says I'm crewing this race, it means you're going not to run it. Um, you don't have an entry bib, but you're going to support your runner at the different checkpoints. All right. So, and they are usually bopping around to different checkpoints. Oh yeah. And that's okay. it's actually really fun. I almost yeah. enjoy crewing more than I enjoy racing sometimes. It's just a big party, right? And, right, right. and you're, you're waiting for your runner to come in and everybody's chatting and, and you get to see all the round, all the elites come in and then, um, 
you know, your runner come in and, and then you, as soon as they come through, you pack up everything and then you go to the next spot and you unpack everything. And you often have your own little cold beverage there and you're waiting for them to come in. And yeah, it's, it's a really, um, it's a community kind of feel when you're crewing because mm-hmm. often runners run almost the same pace through a race too. So you'll get to know the crew of the runners that are all running at uh, the same pace. Yeah. So yeah. It's That's fun. neat. It's almost like tailgating. <laughs> it is. It's totally tailgating. Absolutely. People will set up, I've seen people set up barbecues. Oh my and, goodness. You know, potlucks and yeah, and have their own little gazebos if it's hot uh, for their crewing. So oh my goodness. You know, typically you'll have a wagon, uh, those Costco wagons, you know, that you can fold and unfold and then you yeah. put all your stuff in so you're not carrying it from your car because, you know, the trail head is usually not right beside where you can park. There's a little bit of a walk. So mm-hmm. yeah, there's a science to crewing. There's been a whole podcast done on how to crew a race properly. Wow. But... Okay. All right. So let's go to some letters that I have no clue what they mean. Um, so DFL, are we talking about like an airport? What, what is DFL? <laughs> <laughs> Dead F and last. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> That's what it means. Nobody wants to be DFL. All so right. Just, so, so in the ultra world, winning isn't necessarily in the cards for some of us. We just don't want to be DFL. Just don't. So that's that's what that means. Yeah. Okay. So they don't like take pride in that. They don't like give awards <laughs> for the person who is DFL. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not like a thing at races. <laughs> well, actually, there's. I would say maybe there is awards at some of them, but. <laughs> it is so a good example is gold uh, the golden hour at western states the last hour between hour 23 and 24 is really special um and the the last person to cross some of those big finish lines they've worked just as hard plus right mm-hmm. you think of an elite that finishes in 100 miles in 15 hours yeah of course they've suffered but they're, they've been in bed and woken up and had breakfast <laughs> and, and you know, slept slept in their own bed. And then the person crossing the finish line at the 24-hour mark um, has lost a whole night's sleep. They've missed a few more meals. They've worked really hard, too. So it's it's pretty special to watch the people that do DFL, even though we all joke that nobody wants to. Right. All right. What about DNF? That's, that's pretty uh, universal, right? Did not finish. And that's yep. another one. So... You know, Carolyn and I actually did a whole podcast. I forget the number. Oh, yeah. It was called I li- Anatomy I that of the one. DNF. Yes. I, yeah. I was, that was a great one. Yeah. So there's a real um, yeah, discussion on how road runners and runners running shorter races address and maybe might DNF um, and might accept a DNF in different ways versus trail runners. But yeah, did not finish in the pain cave. People often think about that. Do I... Do I want a DNF or not? And of course, nobody wants to, but sometimes it happens. All right. And then DNS, if I had a guess, did not start? Did not start. Yeah. Is that a thing like at the Chicago Marathon, will they list the people that DNSed? It's very I common don't know, really, in really, the truth. I, I, I would imagine the elites probably, like if that did happen, I would imagine. I'm not sure though. So don't quote okay. me. Yeah. No, it's... um. A lot of the different, you know, starter lists and race rosters will, will very specifically list the DNSs. In right. Running. I know. I'm trying yeah. to like think of it just, you know, I haven't done huge races, but, you know, when you're scrolling through times, like I've never seen a DNS on, but I would imagine for some of the majors and like the elites, if someone was supposed to be there and they didn't start, I would imagine they would list it, but. Not Especially if it was a last sure. minute decision, right? Like they might right. have their bib, they might have been there, but for some reason right. in the morning they didn't cross the start line. So yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So this one sounds a little trippy here. Um, LSD. What's an LSD, LSD run? <laughs> okay. So LSD. Yeah. This is a fun one. You throw out the term at a dinner party. I'm going to go do an LSD run tomorrow morning and you're going to get a few looks, but that stands for <laughs> long, slow distance. So again, not, not an exclusive term to trail runners, but let's be honest, trail runners tend to do a lot more of those really long, slow distance runs. Um, so yeah, that's what LSD means. I would argue 
roadrunners need to do more of those mm. <laughs> long, slow distance runs. You just need to find a gnarly trail down. and then that will slow you down. <laughs> that was actually the theme of uh, uh, recording that I, I just um, was kind of a little passionate about and just did an impromptu recording actually this morning on kind of that topic. It was like, uh, slow the heck down. I was just... Yes. Yeah, went on somewhat of a low rant, um, but yes, I would I would argue that um, most roadrunners would benefit from a, a longer, slower duration or distance run in improving in their overall fitness and actually getting faster if that is their goal um, in their training. Um, so we actually talked about Carol and I talked about like um, Boston qualifier and then. Um, we talked about uh, the the BQ plus the buffer, um, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. I don't know what a double qualifier is. What's a double qualifier? Okay, so in the trail running world, there's a few key races that you have to qualify for. So the most well known is Western States 100. Very, um, I would say, analogous to the Boston Marathon. Right? It's that iconic, one of the oldest. It is the oldest hundred in the United okay. States. Um, and so everybody's always looking for their state's qualifier. Okay. Now there are a few other races and the two that come to mind most significantly would be hard rock. So the hard rock 100 is in Colorado. Um, and it, you also need to qualify for that. The other one would be UTMB ultra trail du Mont Blanc, which is in, uh, Chamonix, France. And so if somebody's looking for a double qualifier, they're often looking for a qualifier that gets them into two of those three races. Triple would be amazing. <laughs> Very rare. Oh, okay. Um, so races that are have qualifier status, not every race can be a qualifier. It has to be on the approved list. Um, so if you're looking for a double qualifier, you're looking for a race that is usually pretty long, that might cost you a lot of money to get there <laughs> and also a lot of energy and time to train for. So if you can qualify for two races, by doing one race, that's kind of the holy grail. So a double qualifier will yeah. allow you to enter both. Lotteries. That makes sense. Awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, I could see that being very desirable, um, and those races would be popular. Um, yes, to they do sell those out double qualifiers. Very fast. Yeah. Typically, I'll, I use the word typically a lot, don't I? I got to stop that. Um, you will have to get online, you know, within minutes of opening and just keep mm. getting register <laughs> to, get, <laughs> to get into the, um, if there is no lottery, if there's a lottery, then you're entering that and you hope your name gets pulled. Mm. Interesting. All right. Let's uh, finish off here with, with a little, uh, it sounds like it, it's an award, the golden, the golden ticket. What's the golden ticket? You like win something? Yeah. So again, back to Western States, which is on a lot of runners bucket lists to to run at Western States. There are of the qualifying races for Western States, there are some of them that are golden ticket races. And a golden ticket race is one where the top two females and the top two males get automatic entry into Western States. So if you don't want to take your chances of getting in the lottery and running a bunch of qualifiers and you know you're pretty fast you can show up at one of these races and as long as you get first or second you're guaranteed into western states that's a term i believe that is pretty exclusive just to western states but people talk about it so much in the trail running community golden ticket golden ticket golden ticket that's what they're talking about interesting yeah do people like try to show up so is it only certain races that you can get gold ticket or like any sanctioned race if you wind up finishing first no, or second? Has, has to be a, a golden ticket designated race. And there's only a handful of them because you can imagine oh, okay. you can't give out four entries at every race in the U.S. or else <laughs> there'd be no spots left for Western states. So they're pretty coveted. They're highly competitive. I, I believe, is it this weekend? Or next weekend, Black Canyons is happening in in um, Arizona, and that's a golden ticket race. So because it's the first of the year, <laughs> um, and it's it's cool down in Arizona right now, it's a highly competitive race. There's a lot okay. of people heading down to that one, hoping to get a golden ticket. Ah, I see. Very interesting. Um, is there any other uh, term or lingo that you uh, feel that we haven't talked about that you would like to mention? 
Oh, goodness. We think we covered um, everything. I think we've covered a lot of them. Yeah. You know? That's one thing is that there will always be new words kind of created or new things that sure. people have kind of said, um, especially in trail running. We are we're weird sometimes, right? <laughs> we're also <laughs> sleep deprived. So we'll make up things and, and double meanings for a lot of words. So I'm sure the, the lexicon will continue to evolve over time, but maybe you've learned a few terms today that might make you sound more intelligent the next time you're talking to a trail runner you'll know exactly. yes yeah i definitely did and yeah thank you so much for sharing uh those terms and if someone wanted to hear more of your goodness and learn about either trail running or really learn from others because you have a lot of great um guests that you have on on your show to kind of share their stories um you know where could our healthy runner community learn more about um what you do yeah, so I will direct you to our podcast, which is the Inspired Souls podcast. Dwayne um, has been so gracious to kind of help help us get the word out about our podcast, and we get the word out about yours, Dwayne. Uh, you can find us on Instagram um, at Inspired Souls with an S O L E S, like the soles of your shoes. Inspired Souls Cast. Um, we are on Apple, Spotify, Google, all the different players. Personally, you can find me on Instagram as well. My handle is Flying Phalanges One. Um, maybe you can link that up so I don't have to yep, spell it I will on air. Link it uh, up. <laughs> phalanges being your fingers and your toes. Um, yeah. So and I'm also on Facebook. So feel free to follow along. Yeah, um, I will definitely link all of those in the show notes wherever you're listening to this. Kim, thank you so much for coming on again. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Uh, this was fun. <laughs> this was fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was really fun. I, I always enjoy chatting with you, Dwayne. All right. I'm going to try to go for an LSD run uh, this weekend. And listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Hopefully you learned some uh, terms that you didn't know. And um, yeah, you can enjoy some of the uh, buffed out tracks and the mashed potato snow trails. And as always, let's maintain a strong mind, a strong body, and let's just keep on running. Until next time.